Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. Welcome to a very special edition of the Frontline Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lake, and I'm joined by my colleague and co-host, Gene Signorini. Uh, it's definitely a special episode, Justin, and I'm excited, as I know you are, to celebrate a milestone, publishing 50 episodes of the Frontline Innovators Podcast. And we thought it'd be great to share some of the highlights from the many wonderful conversations we've had since we launched the show eight months ago. It's hard to believe that it's already been eight months. Just eight months ago, we decided to launch Frontline Innovators, and the response within the industry has been really amazing. I'm super appreciative of our guests who have shared their time and insights with us and our audience. We launched the podcast with the goal of raising awareness for an issue that, number one, we thought was important, and number two, we felt wasn't getting much attention. The challenges frontline workers face when dealing with disruption, change, and technology, and how leaders within those organizations are innovating to help them. Gene, why don't you set the stage a little bit for today's episode and why we pulled it together the way that we did? Sure. Well, I think you and I both have learned so much from our guests, and I think we wanted to share some of the key themes you've heard in our conversations. Every episode we've done provides great insights, and I certainly encourage our listeners to go back and tune in to each of, uh, each one of them if they haven't done so already. Um, but I know we thought it'd be great to feature some clips from the first 50 episodes, share some of the nuggets that we heard along the way, and hopefully kind of tell a story about what we've learned uh, in doing the podcast over the last several months. Yeah, I agree. All the guests have been really amazing. And this is really just a small sample of what we've heard. But we hope you'll enjoy our first 50 episode. And Gene, why don't you kick it off with the first one? Sure. Uh, you know, I think what we found is that there are kind of some recurrent themes that that come up. Um, and I think we want to highlight a, a few of those kind of big, big picture themes, you know, with some of those insights of our guests. The first one that we kind of came across in the episodes was the impact felt by frontline workers from the digital transformation initiatives that are happening all around them. Um, whether it's, you know, new mobile tech rollouts um, and also certainly a lot of the change that they're facing just in the, in the general workforce. So it's this kind of theme of disruption, um, which can include many things, um, but certainly a lot of it around digital transformation. And I think it's probably appropriate to kind of kick this off with the first, very first guest we had on our show is Jen McComas from IBM. She's a CTO of their energy and utilities practice. Uh, and I thought she just had a, a, a great comment that stuck with me from the very, very beginning. And I kind of went back and used several times myself. So uh, I'm going to let Jen take it over from here. So it was always ingrained in me that you go out, I was working for a manufacturing company at the time, you go out, you walk the floors, you talk to people, you learn about what they're doing. And these are folks that, you know, granted, it was a combination of, uh, you know, computer integrated manufacturing line, that some of the operations were automated, but, you know, the, the rest of it was working with supervisors and folks with soldering irons in their hands. And how are you doing your job? And what are the challenges? And, and what can we do to make that better? that's not a technology conversation. That's a business conversation. And in order to, as I had said, do technology with people, not to yes. people in a way that makes their lives better. You don't start with technology. You get out of the data center, you go out and talk to people, you understand what, what, they, what value they bring to the organization and the work that they do. And then you use your own expertise to start talking with them about not only what are you doing, what are some of the things that we could do to make it better, and then what's your tolerance for adopting a technology solution to, to help you do that job? Because here's the thing, again, we do technology to folks. We don't necessarily go out 
have conversations, figure out what the, the culture and the readiness is of the organization to adopt technology. We just say, I can give you this automated process and that's going to make your life easier. You know, Justin, I think the, the thing that stood out, that phrase that stood out is, is not doing technology to people but with them. And I think that's, again, one of those recurrent themes we heard, right? Too often, I think technology is done to frontline workers without understanding what they need or why they should care about it or what's in it for them. Yeah, I wasn't the one that uh, interviewed this guest, but I have listened to this episode. I've actually listened to it more than once. And I have probably quoted Jen on that statement a hundred or a thousand times since that episode. The, the other thing that she said, which it sounds so obvious when you say it out loud, but oftentimes we don't pay enough attention to this is you've got to go out and talk to people. It's a, it's a, at the end of the day, technology, digital transformation is really about people more than it is about the technology. And I think Jen made a, a fantastic case for that in her episode. Yeah. And I, one of the, the next kind of key, you know, phrases that sticks with me um, from the long line of podcast is, is from this next clip. Uh, and this was Nikki Tollefson, uh, who's the principal change management consultant at CH Robinson. And first of all, I mean, you know, we talk very often, I think most of the people we've had on the show, if not all of them, Justin, are just truly passionate about what they do. That's why they're sharing their insights with us, but it comes through loud and clear with Nikki just loved her energy and her enthusiasm and her empathy, I think for, um, for, the people that she serves, particularly the frontline workers. And I think you'll kind of hear a bit of that in this next clip. I'm sure you hear this from a lot of the change people you talk to has never been greater. And, and I kind of call it change whiplash, right? Like unintentionally, I think, you know, through really, really good intentions, we, we throw things at them to try to help them. Um, but we do that through so many different venues that, that they're trying to like keep up with it all, right? And so I really think one of the biggest challenges is just all of that change that's coming at them, trying to absorb it, trying to understand how to integrate that right into what they're doing on a daily basis um, in, in the most efficient way. So it's the change whiplash phrase to me, Justin, is just, I don't know, perfectly encapsulates kind of what the frontline is going through these days. Yeah. And, and another expression that I've heard used a lot by change management professionals is change saturation. And it's, it's just another version of that same thing that we're really bombarding the men and women in the field with so much change all at one time. And it's, it's easy to get frustrated with them, but we really have to take a look back and say, how much change are we introducing to those men and women while they still have a full-time job to do at the same time? And, and are we asking too much of them? And, and, really in the end, jeopardizing the success of the programs at the same time. Yeah. And we've often, I know you and I have often used the phrase, the perfect storm, right? Um, there's so much going on for frontline workers, particularly in light of the pandemic on top of everything else that they've always gone through. It truly is a perfect storm for them right now. Um, and I think Nikki just hit it right on the head with that. Yeah. So the, the next uh, clip I, I want to share is from Christy Walker. She's a change management consultant at Arizona Public Service. And she speaks about this concept of failing safe, safely and failing fast. So I'm going to let, let the clip play, and then uh, I'll come back in and comment on this afterward. We talk about um, failing safely and failing fast. Um, so if we do try stuff, we try it kind of in a safe uh, space where that it, it's not disruptive, um, and we learn from it. And as long as we learn from it, we're good. Um, so IT, for example, our entire IT organization has adopted Agile now. Um, we didn't have that when I joined in 2016. Um, so that's a big change. They wanna deliver um, solutions faster uh, and better. Uh, and they're really working on their um, service management as well, uh, really uh, innovating that a little bit more to, to provide better customer service for the utility. So a lot of things like that have been implemented at our company. And, um, and anytime we see somebody who's like, but we've always done it that way. We always say growth mindset, growth mindset. That's, that's kind of our uh, mantra for, for taking people out of that old thinking. 
So one of my big takeaways from listening to Christy again is, is the importance of setting the right tone from a culture standpoint. And she said an expression that I had not heard of previously. So, you know, we've all heard the expression failing fast, but it, it's unsurprising that somebody in, an, in a utility organization would add to that and say, we talk about failing safely and failing fast. So failing fast, you know, Gene, you and I have done work with other utility companies, and we know that sometimes they're not quite as nimble as uh, other enterprises, in part because they have a, an obvious need to really emphasize safety and safety and agility don't necessarily go hand in hand. So I thought it was really interesting that she talks about that challenge in a utility organization of affecting the culture, changing the culture in such a way that they can permit themselves to fail fast, but also with the added qualifier that they also have to be safe at the same time. And I think it just speaks to no change can be done just at a project level. This is a cultural thing that has to be implemented across the entire business if you expect those individual projects to be successful. Yeah, I think it's really interesting you picked up on that. I did as well. And, you know, just as you were talking, it reminded me of what was, I think, the Facebook mantra, which was move fast and break stuff, right? Yeah. And and obviously, some companies cannot move fast and they can't afford to break stuff. Utilities, you know, is an energy, you know, critical infrastructure that they really, you know, have to be mindful of of the changes that they're going through as as an organization, I think it's refreshing to hear. I know it's, oh, it, like you said, it is a huge challenge for companies to adapt that not mindset, that fail fast mindset um, in general. Um, we talk about the cultural changes or, or the changes that the frontline itself has to go through. But in order to enable the frontline, there needs to be an organizational cultural shift as well. No question. So the next clip that we want to highlight is from Kurt Kidwell. Kurt is the continuous improvement manager at another utility at American Electric Power. And, you know, one of the things that Kurt said is very near and dear to my heart. You know, I have always said you, you can't build technology solutions for the front line from a conference room. I'm going to leave it there, let you play the clip, and then um, we'll come back and, and we'll talk about what Kurt said. I think folks that are generally work in an office type setting uh, the, the change has been relatively simple uh, as far as, you know, getting in, into their teams and, and working through the visual uh, tools that we have with, you know, with WebEx, Zoom and, and things like that. But what I do think is really hard is for those workers that are at, out in the field, especially our line workers who are out there uh, trying to keep the lights on, uh, but having to stop to try to use a, a, a one, one guy's got a cell phone that, that to try to connect to a, a virtual meeting and it's uncomfortable. Uh, nine times out of 10, they're outside. And uh, so it's really hard to connect with those guys in a virtual presence. And what we're finding is, is hopefully as we get better with our technology and have, they have the, the tools and the resources to do that, we can come up with some, some better ways to do that. So first of all, you know, we, we often use the expression, keeping the lights on to reflect to, uh, to represent keeping things moving uh, in a business. When, when Kurt is talking about the men and women in the field and his organization, keeping the lights on, it's, it's not just figurative. It's <laughs> literal. These are men and women that are out in the field that are literally keeping the lights on. And at the same time, they're trying to communicate, you know, and, and we talked about this extensively on, on his episode about the challenges of the pandemic and a lot of the people that are in support roles back in headquarters going to work remotely. And so for them, it was easy to flip on a, a Teams, you know, or Zoom call. Um, but the reality is the men and women in the field are still in the field. And, and he points out they're literally working outside. So they've got all the environmental conditions. They've got all the challenges of being remote. And they don't have the luxury of, of doing their job, you know, from, from their kitchen table or their living room. And so, yeah, I mean, you and I know this because we've talked about this pretty extensively yeah. over the years, but um, you can't build technology solutions without taking time to go out in the field and see how the men and women are actually doing their job. And without that context, without bringing that empathy back into the corporate office, your programs are less likely to be successful, period. 
And I, I think Kurt kind of makes the, a good case for that throughout this episode. Yeah, it actually reminds me of a, another conversation I had recently. Harris Muhammad um, is another guest that folks should check out. He, he called it boots on the ground. Uh, what they do is, is really getting the boots on the ground, literally putting hard hats on, steel toe boots, getting out there, um, getting out there with those frontline workers to, to truly understand, okay, what is it exactly that you do? What are the things you have to go through? Um, to solve your problems. I, I think the other thing to note here is just building on what you were talking a little bit about is, listen, a lot of companies already had a lot of the tools in place for their desk workers, right, to deal with the challenges of remote work in the pandemic. Now, a lot of it wasn't necessarily maximized, right? There was probably a lot of fumbling around, but they had video conferencing tools, they had teams, they had chat, they had all that. And I think one of the realizations is that's come up through with a lot of conversations is this is these frontline workers. We actually don't have the technology tools in place that we probably need uh, to support them. And I think that's that's an important um, point to keep in mind. Well, and as you're saying that, Gene, I mean, you know, even if we look at experiences like Teams and and some of the other solutions that are in place today, yeah, on occasion, any of us that are primarily office workers working on a desktop or a laptop, you know, we've taken an occasional Zoom or, or Teams call from our iPad or our phone or something like that. Uh, but those platforms are not optimized for those experiences. And therefore, they're not optimized for the scenario that frontline workers find themselves in most of the time. So where, you know, those of us that the deskbound workers can use those tools as an auxiliary when necessary, uh, they don't necessarily fulfill the gap of being a primary tool for the men and women on the front lines. And actually, I think that serves this comment really serves as a great transition to our next clip and the next guest we wanted to highlight, um, you know, I, and I think we're kind of branching into a kind of our second theme, which is the theme of empowerment, right? Thinking about how do we put technology in place in the hands of frontline workers that really empowers them and really helps them. And, you know, Tulsi, Tulsi Keshkamat uh, is the director of modern work place transformation for frontline worker at Microsoft. So we talk about teams, you talk about all these things that originally were really optimized for, you know, desk workers, not for frontline workers. Well, Tulsi's job, right, is, is identifying how we kind of really tailor technology for the frontline worker. And, and the thing about it is she doesn't talk a heck of a lot about tech, technology. She talks an awful lot about empathy and empowerment, which is what I really loved about that conversation. So let's take a listen to Tulsi. I so love that you're making that point because it is critical to understand that the in access to information, the ability to connect and collaborate, all of that is very, very relevant to the frontline, right? You have to give them the, you have to empower them allow them to make the decisions and oftentimes their decisions have to be a lot more real time than in the case of an of someone who's uh, sitting at a desk i also really like how you double down on the fact that information workers and frontline workers are different and we have to think about them differently it isn't about giving someone a phone like me being able to check my email on a phone is very different from the tasks that a frontline worker has to perform and the tools that they are using in order to perform those tasks. So really keeping that difference in mind and being thoughtful about are we giving them the right technology to do that set of tasks? Yeah. That is super important. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, it's great to hear someone like Tulsi, particularly at a company like Microsoft, Right, which we know has such a, a large in influence in enterprise today, really taking the time to kind of think about those, the very specific use cases for frontline workers. And I, and I think, you know, it, it goes to this fact is, listen, technology is definitely not a one size fits all proposition. And it's most definitely not a one size fits all, all proposition for the frontline. Yeah, and she, she makes a point that, Man, it just makes my blood boil because I, I agree with her. And I think a lot of people miss this, that the use cases for frontline workers and their use of, of mobile technology are very different, right? So what she talked about is, you know, giving someone a phone like me, being able to check my email on a phone is very different from the tasks the frontline workers have to perform in the field. And, and that's true. You know, many knowledge workers who uh, are issued a laptop or a desktop, they spend a lot of their time behind email and calendar tools and things like that. And, and those tools are naturally adopted very well and transition over to mobile pretty easily. 
But that's a very different scenario than the task oriented work that a lot of the men and women on the front lines are doing. So their applications are different. The use is different. The workflows are entirely different. So it's not just about being able to, to send a message out to those folks, but it's, it's really just an entirely different way for them to do business. And um, it is good to hear. I, I was very excited to, to have Microsoft represented here in Frontline Innovators because it is good to see that they're focusing on this and, and beginning to look at the frontline workers, um, you know, in, in a in a new way and paying more attention to them than maybe, you know, the tech industry has has paid to them in the past. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, one of the interesting things to talk about is it goes back to the whole boots, boots on the ground theory, not designing from conference room. I think too often some of the people making technology decisions within organizations, they actually don't have that intimate familiarity with what their own frontline workers are, are kind of going through. Now, I, the folks that we're talking to on, on our conversations are the exception to the rule, I think, in a lot of cases. And that's why they're the innovators and that's why they're kind of pushing for change in the organizations. But it isn't always the case. There's a great story from our next, uh, the next guest I want to highlight about a company that's kind of literally kind of flipped their thinking a bit in terms of, of how they can empower their frontline. So uh, this next clip comes from Sonia Shelton who's CEO at Executive Leadership Consulting, um, and she's got a pretty cool uh, little story. So let's take a listen to Sonia. I think a lot of companies lose sight of what being a frontline worker means, right? So they're on the front line, which means they're closest to the customer. And uh, one organization that I worked with in China, they, they were, um, the company had a hotel and three restaurants, and they, the CEO there, actually, when he showed me his org chart, it was actually flipped upside down. So the, the frontline workers were at the top of the org chart and he was at the bottom. And I loved his philosophy because he said, he, and I stayed in his hotel and I ate at a couple of the restaurants and I have never had such an incredible customer experience <laughs> in my life, a guest experience in my life. Um, and I didn't speak the language, so even more so, right? So, um, but he looked at it like those, those frontline workers are the closest to our guests and we have to make sure that they have everything they need to be able to provide those guests with the best possible customer experience right so so everybody in the organization all the way down to the C, what he would say down to the no. ceo right um what is their their whole job is to make sure that those frontline workers can be the best they can be and deliver the best service they can be and i think i think it's um you know sometimes when we look when we have that our, our uh, up, upright pyramid looking at the organization that way, we lose sight of the fact that those are the people that are helping make the money. Yeah, I just I just love that story. Um, and I was, you know, I think I was smiling the whole time she was she was telling it um, because I think it just encapsulated everything we said is is right. Really, you know you've got to prioritize your frontline workers. Um, you've got to really understand and say, we need to give them everything that they need, you know, um, first and foremost. What, what Sonia just described is the reason that frontline innovators exists. It, it's to help raise awareness that without the men and women on the front lines interacting with customers and actually doing the work that each customer, each company represents, that there is no business without them, right? And so we do need to flip it. And, and maybe if flipping the org chart is a great visualization to, to make that point. Um, but I think, you know, the whole part of Frontline Innovators being here is to raise the awareness and help folks understand that all corporate initiatives that affect the front lines, we need to flip that around a little bit and we need to put them front and center and make sure that they can be successful. And then all of the other corporate objectives will fall into place behind that. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I, and I think it segues nicely into kind of our next theme, if you will, which is, okay, we've talked about, you know, the challenges the frontline workers face. We've talked about the need to kind of think about their needs and priorities and empower them. The other thing that we've heard over and over again is we've got to communicate better, right? We've, you know, historically done a very poor job or inefficient job, at least in kind of getting the message out to our frontline workers about the kind of whys and, and what's that we're doing. Yeah. And our first clip that I'm going to share is from an interview that I did with uh, Andrea Johnson. Andrea is the senior manager of change management at Sprouts Farmers Market. 
And she makes a fantastic point about the correlation between change management and marketing. So I'll leave that there for a minute and let you play the clip and then we'll come back. At the end of the day, organizational change management is, is marketing to your internal employees. And it's uh, a little bit more difficult because they know what's behind the curtain and they've gotten, you know, some of them have PTSD from, from previous technology launches where they, you know, where, where things didn't get, go so smoothly. I mean, cause let's face it, not every technology launch has some type of, type of hiccup. Um, and when you're on the receiving end of that, uh, because the first time you saw it was the day that it launched, um, it, you know, it can be pretty painful and yeah. a lot of repercussions there. So I, you know, a, a key aspect of marketing is communicating the benefit of this new thing that the marketer is, is communicating. And I, I think what, what Andrea pointed out is that that's really what change management inside an organization or a big part of what change management is really all about is communicating to those who will be affected what this change is about, how it's going to affect them, and ultimately help them understand what's in it for them. And essentially, that is exactly the same as you know what marketers do with us in, in the consumer realm. So I thought that was a, a really good way to think about it because it really speaks to building a relationship with those affected and figuring out the most effective ways to, to communicate with those folks. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, there's, I love the term she used, it's marketing to her internal employees, but I also think it has to be genuine marketing, mm -hmm. right? Because I think she alluded to the fact that, you know, they'll see right through it. They know what's kind of going on behind the curtain. And I think there's a lot of anxiety. That's another theme that we've heard of a lot on the show, which is anxiety. And in some cases, maybe some distrust um, between the frontline and, and senior management. And so, you know, I think that effective communication, that marketing has to be seen as genuine marketing. Yeah. And, and Andrew and I have actually talked about this. Uh, I think we talked about it a little bit more in the podcast. We've also talked about it separately, but I've also talked about it with several other podcast guests, which is the, the transparency and candor that's required by the folks implementing change to acknowledge to the people affected that, you know, Andrea refers to it as PTSD from, from a previous technology launch, right? Um, you know, not to make light of that, but people have had bad experiences in the past. And so when we come out with some new tech innovation that we want to bring out to the front lines, and we don't acknowledge that maybe in the past, this hasn't gone so well. If we don't acknowledge that we lose credibility as, as an implementation team and the support functions and everything else. And so what Andrew speaks about and several other guests have talked about is that we really just need to bring some candor to that. And, you know, the goal needs to be to develop trust through that transparency with those that are affected so that we can all be successful together. Yeah. I, and I think the clip from our next guest, Sally Fahey, who uh, is another Microsoft um, uh, guest uh, who works in their frontline worker, uh, first line worker group as well. She's a global black belt for their modern work specialist. And I know she works kind of very closely um, with those customers and, and frontline teams. And I think she's got kind of this, this point to be made, I think that follows up really well on, um, on these, these last thoughts we've kind of been going through. So love to kind of share um, Sally's thoughts now. So again, what's that logical order? Where's that sort of two-way give get? What's in it for the actual frontline to get them to do something different versus what's the actual return to the business of starting with this particular use case? So it, it's, um, it's a fun space to be in because there's lots of different um, complexities when you start to think about it programmatically. How do you deliver these services you know, right down to what's the way that they're going to be able to you know, connect? And this yeah. is where we see a lot of different anxieties or um, challenges for different parts of the business and very often it's almost like a two speed you know anyone that's in the sort of technology teams where we can potentially be going well hang on slow down security and compliance and different parts of the business are like well, we've just got a business objective we just have to get this done you know particularly pandemic you know communicate we've just got to throw something out there so we can do it because we've lost our you know our verbal chain of, um, of relaying information and the the lens that different parts of the business We'll look at this from a different as well. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the thing that Sally said right at the beginning of that clip was this two-way give and what's in it for the frontline worker versus what's in it for the business. And I think that's another thing we've, we've kind of heard of, which is 
no, when you're making that communication, right, it's, it's what's in it for them. Right. Um, and too often, you know, solutions are, let's face it, right. We're, you know, companies are trying to drive business improvement, right. And business improvement starts at the front line. That's where they're going to realize that business improvement at the same time, in order to gain that buy-in, right. I think you really need to kind of communicate. It's not what's in it for the business, right. What's, how is this going to make your life easier, right. How is this going to help you and how's it, you know, how do we alleviate that anxiety that is associated with change? Yeah. And in the quote here about, you know, we've just got to throw something out there so that we can do it. Um, that actually just drives me insane. And you and I've seen this countless times in, in our past life when organizations really didn't put thought into how that tech innovation would be absorbed by the men and women, particularly on the front lines. And it's, it's actually it doesn't even serve the needs of the folks who are being short-sighted um, because in the end, you get a lot of resistance to that change in the field. If you haven't communicated and explained what's in it for them. And in the end, you don't meet your objectives. And this is where you and I've come across projects over time when they didn't have great utilization of the technology that they had invested in, and they weren't getting the ROI that they expected from their investments. And when you track that stuff back, a lot of times it's because it was just kind of thrown out there. There was too much emphasis placed on the technology. And as I always say, that kind of ones and zeros flying through the network. But if you haven't focused enough energy on what's in it for the humans, then all, all the technology is not going to matter. Yeah. And I think, you know, let's face it, there's just some one of the big challenges is there's some basic difficulty in communicating to the front line, at least in a common and consistent way, right? Because they're distributed because of all those, those factors. So um, I think it probably leads us pretty well to our next it, clip. It, it really does. So Jessica Sirico is senior training and change management specialist at Suez. And she actually, I think gave some really great examples in, in this clip that we're going to play about how to more effectively communicate uh, with those frontline folks. So go ahead and play that. And uh, yeah, I'm going to point out something else after this quote too. So um, especially having someone come in from corporate, you know, to go through new changes and new processes and kind of explain how to do things differently. I think there's kind of like a self-preservation there. Um, so they kind of, it's very natural to put up your defense in that case um, because, you know, it's almost like a, who are you to tell me how to do my job? But that's why I always like to start off a lot of the trainings that I do um, kind of outlining, like, I'm not here to tell you how to fix a main break. I'm not here to tell you how to flush your hydrants. I'm just here to help you understand how to enter that, those details of the main break into a new application instead of on paper or wherever you were entering it before. So it's really a partnership there. And that's the, the the um, the way I like to approach training because it really is a learning experience for me too. You know, correct me if I'm not saying something right. Tell me how you do things today. So it's really a give and take there. So for me, the the conversation with Jessica was all about earning credibility with the men and women on the front lines through transparency and the humility that she brought to those conversations. And to, to try to level set with them to say, hey, I'm not an expert in your role. You are the experts in, in doing that job in the field. I'm just here to try to convey how your job will be easier and things will be easier to track and what's in it for you if you're using this technology now uh, in order to, to go alongside with the other work that you're doing. I thought that was fantastic. She, we didn't play this part of the clip, but I also have to share something because I've repeated this about a thousand times since the episode. She also said one of my favorite all-time quotes. She told a story in the episode. You have to go back and listen to the episode to get the full version of this, but she said, when she goes out to, to talk with the men and women in the field, she describes it and says, learning new technology for work is like breaking in a pair of boots. And, and to go on with her quote, she basically says, you know, it's a little uncomfortable when you first slip them on, but if you just give it a little time and give it a few days or a couple of weeks before you know it, you don't want to take them off. And I thought that was such a powerful way to convey the way that change feels for people in that it does feel a little bit uncomfortable. 
but if you can stick it out and give it a chance and give it a couple of days or a couple of weeks in the case of, of maybe some new leather boots, then in the end, they're going to feel so good. You're not going to want to take them off. And I thought she was just absolutely brilliant for using that, particularly with the types of men and women that she's working at. You know, she's working in a utility organization, uh, a lot of guys wearing boots, right? So it was a great way for her to convey that message to them. And I, I just can imagine it being super effective. Yeah. And I think it's, on, it's honest, right? And I think that's, yeah. that's what's, that's what's really important about it is listen it's there's going to be a little pain there's probably going to be some blisters before we you know yeah. before we kind of overcome this but at the end of the day it's it's going to be better um better for you um and and i think that's that's great i think our next guest too talks a little bit about this and you know that transition you know uh, um from kind of communication communications to start you know but how do we get these people kind of how do they break in to the new change, right? Like, you know, dragging this boot analogy all the way to its fullest is you got to start wearing them, right? You got to start doing things and training um, is, is an important point. So uh, I want to bring up a clip from Sarah Nicastro, um, who's VP of customer advocacy at, at IFS. Um, I know a lot of our listeners know Sarah uh, from the industry. Um, she's a podcast host herself and a, and a great guest. And she doesn't pull punches typically when she talks. And I, I just loved having a conversation with her. So let's hear a little bit from Sarah. So the first thing is a recognition that if you are trying to do things differently than you've done before, something has to change, right? So one of the biggest mistakes is that a company has this initiative to, you know, move to outcomes or to create more experiences or to servitize, but they're not changing anything about the frontline worker, right? And so that's a big disconnect, right? So I think the first thing is just an awareness that if the intended outcome is different, that needs to be com communicated. It needs to be clear. It needs to be understood. There needs to be training involved. Um, and you have to understand that perhaps not everyone in place is going to be up to that task, right? And so um, the first thing to talk about is, so how do you make some of that change with your existing workforce? Okay, so the, like I said, you need to clearly articulate what it is you're, you're looking for and how that might differ from, you know, the historical role. So, you know, I mean, I think she touches on a number of things here. Um, you know, one is something I know you and I often talk about, which is, listen, you can create the greatest strategy right? You can select the best technology. You can have a great plan, right? For digital transformation. But if the frontline workforce doesn't adopt it, if they can't buy into it, if they can't change, then the whole thing fails. We talk about it as they're the last link in that chain, right? But in most cases, the most important one. And I think, you know, she kind of gets right to the heart of that in, in, in that clip. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, another example of how the most important aspects of successful digital transformation don't actually have to do with the technology itself. I mean, that, that's actually a recurring theme across this entire podcast series. And, and when I think back on all the projects I've been a part of over 20 years, there's you know 90 plus percent of the attention is paid to the technology and maybe sometimes 100% is paid to the technology and too little is paid to the people and the impact on them and the process change and, and things like that that go along with it. And so yeah. I think Sarah does a great job. Of yeah. And I think our next clip, you know, is, is, um, it, it kind of continues on this. I love this. This is, um, our, our next guest that we want to highlight is a look pant from, uh, he's the CEO of unvired and, um, he comes from a business that's near and dear to Justin and my, my hearts, which is they design and build applications for companies with large frontline workforces, which is something that Justin and I had done in, in our past. And, and it was kind of the light bulb moment for us to, to kind of, you know, go and say, we need to, companies are struggling with adoption. And I think Alok is one of those guys who gets it, right? He's one of the guys whose, whose company is building those solutions, but recognizes, I think that, well, we got to get that last part of it right, which is, which is the adoption piece. So let's, uh, let's hear what Alok has to say. So I think the first thing is how do you, um, how do you make the, the field service worker effective, right? How do you train them? So that's one. 
On the employee front, um, also equally important is that whole user adoption change management. Yes, you have a great mobile app and you're rolling it out at scale, right? To thousands of users, you know, it could be a beverage company, right? It could be, for example, you know, uh, direct store delivery, right? And mobilizing that process. So how do you get these people trained upfront? And then as you know, app processes change, applications are enhanced, right? Frequently, how do you keep the field service worker, the existing ones, the current ones trained on the new, the new features? And also while at the same time, bringing in onboarding the people who are constantly coming in given the churn. So I think we see uh, the, the user adoption as a big challenge and then user adoption, uh, within user adoption is that whole area of change management, right? So how do you, and the training, right? And how do you train these failed service workers? So uh, lastly, the other challenge is how do you deploy these apps? So, you know, what, what uh, as I said, what I really liked about this from Alok is, is listen, he, he gets it, right? He's, he's been there, right? Helping companies adopt new technology. And I think is recognized, like it's a lot more complex, right? Than just, designing, creating, and just kind of pushing these solutions out to, to mobile devices. Um, that there's a full, we talk about this often, a full life cycle that's involved in it, right? And even after kind of the initial project is done, it's never fully done. One of the things that makes Alok a standout leader of a tech company is rather than hide behind the truth, and say things like, well, our user interface is so good that we don't need to worry about training. He actually comes front and center on that topic and, and acknowledges that no matter how good the user interface is in an application, we're still talking about a, a change management burden that has to be absorbed, a change burden that has to be absorbed by the men and women on the front lines. And, and you're right, he talks about all aspects of that life cycle, not just from the initial technology deployment, but from later when we have new features that are rolled out and when we're onboarding new hires that come in later in the process and things like that. So I, I commend Alok. Uh, you know, he's a good partner uh, of the firm now. And um, I, I think it, it really just speaks to his professionalism and his understanding of the real world of the market that you can't just throw this stuff out there. So it's, it's really refreshing to hear, uh, you know, a, a tech company CEO really understand the full life cycle of what it takes to implement and be successful with the tech. Yeah. And I think just recognizing that, listen, as easy as we make it, like you said, as, as well thought out the design is, as much effort and time we put into it, you know, technology isn't easy for everyone. And regardless, it's still change, right? It's still change. It's still different from the way we were doing things before. Yeah. The next clip we're going to play is from Shelby Metzel. Uh, she is the manager of gas transformation change office at National Grid, another utility company kind of a common theme here with some of the interviews that I've done. And um, she talks about this concept of technology checks. So I'll let you listen to her and then uh, we'll, we'll come back in with some feedback. We had to take into consideration that for the field force, especially, they're not on Teams meetings or Zoom calls often. They're not necessarily familiar with how that even goes of logging into a Zoom call. Um, going on mute, coming off mute, raising your hand and to, you know, get the instructor's attention. Um, so we actually held what we called our technology checks um, ahead of our training sessions so that we could familiarize our field forest with how to do all these things before they came into a training session so that they're not, you know, navigating all that for the very first time right at training when they have to spend a few hours learning this new solution. We wanted them to be able to to join training fresh with a, a fresh mind to be able to absorb all of this information they're getting. So we set up those tech checks um, just ahead of our training sessions to really just help familiarize them with, um, with what that looks like. So this concept that, that Shelby talks about uh, with the tech checks, I, I thought it was such a, a great opportunity to really think about ways that you can let users acclimate with the new technology so that they can really free their minds to learn. And something, you know, you and I know from, from our day job at Skillful that, you know, we've heard from many frontline workers, they prefer learning on their own. And, and I think this is something that we have to accept that all learners are not optimized for learning in a classroom environment. 
So the more that we can do to let those learners learn independently in an environment that feels less threatening to them, less anxiety inducing to them, will ultimately free them up to learn and use their brain capacity for learning and developing this new proficiency uh, rather than, you know, feeling the anxiety of having to learn in front of their peers and just be uncomfortable with the tech, you know, overall. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is, Justin, I, I, I don't know that anybody's really excited about being told they've got to go through training at work, right? Whatever style of training it is. But, you know, you mentioned classroom training for most people that may be walking down the hall, you know, to, um, to a conference room or nowadays, you know, clicking into a virtual session. I think one of the things we've learned is that training on frontline for frontline workers is often a burden, like a real burden, right? It's, it's, it doesn't fit logically into their natural workflow into what they do. They may not even have, they don't have the technology tools. They may not even have a central place to go to for it. I mean, you and I have, have, have seen examples where in order to take training, they've got to like push aside their supervisor at the supervisor's desk and log in to the only, you know, PC that may be in the office, right? Or if they are doing classroom training, it's before they come in in the morning for a shift or after what could be a 12 plus hour shift at the end of the day. And so it's, it's really, you're putting a lot of uh, additional burden on the front line when you're trying to train them to do anything and then layer on top of it, the challenges that we have today, which is in, in this pandemic and remote wor world, which is now we have to familiarize them with tools that they're not even familiarized them so that they can learn something new, completely different. So right. it's just layering on more and more complexity to what they already have. Yeah. I, I can't believe that we're, we're already at the end of this. Uh, I, I know we've only just gone through 10 of the first 50. We've left out just a, a lot of quality conversations with some absolutely amazing professionals that I, I just consider us so fortunate to have had a chance to, to interview the men and women that have taken the time to come on our show and, and share their thoughts and um, allow us all to learn from, from what they have been able to share. So um, you know, for those others that were on those 50 episodes, if we didn't highlight you today, uh, it doesn't mean that we didn't absolutely love the conversation and that it wasn't incredibly valuable to us and our audience. We just only had room for, for 10 of these today. Well, we're going to um, have highlights from the, the hundred probably quicker than we know, Justin. I mean, I know, uh, just like you, I mean, I, this has been just a, uh, an incredible experience kind of hosting this and having these conversations probably better than. I ever imagined. I feel like I've learned a lot and I've met some just really very smart and passionate people. And um, it's one of the best things uh, that I do during the day is when we record one of these episodes. I agree. Well, I hope everybody uh, listening has enjoyed the highlights from our first 50. If you've missed any of these full episodes or even some of the ones that we haven't highlighted today, uh, please go check them out. They're available on YouTube. They're available on all the main uh, podcast platforms. And uh, we'd love to have you listen to uh, some of those other shows as well. Um, also wanted to give a quick preview of some of the things we have planned for the coming months on Frontline Innovators. So for those of you that have been listening regularly, you know we've been spotlighting a number of organizational change management professionals on our episodes lately. Um, we kind of were running with a series really focused on organizational change management and the impact that that can have on successful uh, adoption of technology with the front line. We're gonna continue to do that. We still have a lot of other guests uh, lined up with OCM backgrounds and we're gonna continue to go down that path. But you're also going to begin hearing from some learning and development leaders on how they're helping to tackle the challenges of engaging and developing the frontline workforce. Yeah, I'm excited for that, uh, Justin. I can't wait for some of those conversations. Um, and for the folks listening, if you've enjoyed this and other episodes of Frontline Innovators, please share and rate the podcast. Five-star ratings help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. And a friendly reminder that this podcast uh, and all the other ones are sponsored by Skillful, the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. You can visit the Skillful website at skyllful.com. Wait a second, Gene. How did you say that spelled? S-K-Y-L-L-F-U-L.com. No, <laughs> and as always, we're always looking for more guests for the show. So if you're listening and somebody else comes to mind that you think would be a great guest in the show, or if that person is you, 
Either way, we'd like to meet you or them. Connect with us on LinkedIn, make an introduction, and we'll get that person lined up to be uh, one of our next guests on the show. Gene, thanks. This was fun today. That was great. Thanks, Justin. Um, and thanks, everyone listening. We'll talk to you soon.